Amen. I want to ask that you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Numbers. As we're going to be looking at what it means to be an expected joy, an expectation of joy of a birth. Exactly what does that mean in our lives? What does it mean to you? You know, everyone in this world is always expecting something good to happen in some case, but I think that we would all agree that when it comes to the expectation of a joy of a child coming into a family, whether it be a regular son or a daughter, or whether it be a grandchild, we get excited about it. And sometimes we can look at this and we just can't wait for that moment to arise. I, I know of one such birth that I would like to share with you this morning. We would need to go back, I believe it was July the 12th. It was an early morning uh, birth is what I was told. But something miraculous was happening that day. During that time of this birth of this child, and I know it exquisitely, my memory ain't where it is, but I, I was there when this happened. As I was born, This is what I remember. Some of you might not remember yours. I remember mine. I I heard angels singing. I mean, they were singing. It was an absolute beautiful thing. I remember being wrapped in a swaddling towel. I remember being held close to my mother. And I remember my mother looking down into my eyes and my eyes looking into my mother because I was actually a baby that could see when I was born. And she said to everyone in that room with that great big light above us shining down upon my forehead, looked like a glorious halo. She said, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. It was a wonderful 15 minutes of glory. Then all of a sudden, I heard something that sounded like screeching cats and dogs. It was a horrendous sound. It broke the tranquility of the angelic time. And I realized in the background, I heard my brother Brad crying. But there was an anticipation of a birth. Who in here was anticipating the birth of a child or a grandchild? Y'all have heard me talk about one day, I'm, I'm going to be, I pray, blessed with a grandchild. I'm already loving the fact that the child is here. I don't know if it's going to be a male. I don't know if it's going to be a female because God only made the two. But I'm already in love with it. I don't know if they're going to name it Bart or Barthena. I'm good with either one. But I'm excited about the birth. The expectation Brings joy. Do you remember the expectation of joy when your children were born or your grandchildren? Do you remember telling yourself, we don't know what he or she is going to be, but we're going to do everything we can to encourage, to build, to come up in a nurturing family, to love and to cherish to make sure they have the best of everything that we can to offer. Today I'm going to be sharing with you several people of the Bible. They didn't know exactly the mothers or the fathers, what was going to happen to them. But they knew that they loved having the children in their life long before God did great things with them. If you're able and you're willing, if you would please stand as we read God's word. We'll be speaking about Moses in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6 and 8. And he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet, this is God talking to a group of people, Moses being one of them, outside of a tent. He says, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. In other words, he comes to them in a vision or he comes to them in a dream and he speaks to them in such a way that they know it's God speaking. And he says, I, the Lord, make myself known to him. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. I want you to understand that everyone previous to Moses, when he was speaking to them, he was speaking to them that they knew it was God, but they had to figure some things out. But he says, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful all in my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And behold, the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant? Let us pray. Father, as we move forward during the service today, 
May your word be heard. May minds and hearts be changed. And may it be a glorification to you with everything that is spoken from this pulpit, everything that is thought of in the pew. And Lord, that we would take what we have learned today to share the gospel with others. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we here see that Moses is coming. Now I want you to realize that when Moses was coming of age to have this taken care of, he died at the ripe old age of 120. We understand that when this was happening, God was coming to these people and he was saying, Moses, he is faithful in all my house. And everything that he does, he is faithful in it. He doesn't pick and choose. He doesn't cherry pick. He says he's faithful in this area. He's faithful in this area. He's faithful in this area. And he's faithful in this area. If you look all around, north, south, east, and west, Moses is faithful to God in everything that he does, everything that he says, and everything that he thinks. Does this mean that he was perfect? No, there was sin in Moses' life. But it meant that he was looking towards God and God was looking towards him. And he's saying that he is faithful in my house. And with him, I speak mouth to mouth. In other words, I'm speaking to him face to face. I'm not coming in a vision and I'm not coming in a dream. I speak to him when he's in the presence of God and I'm in the presence of Moses. I'm speaking to him as I am speaking to you from this pulpit today. Clearly, concise, not in riddle, not in visions. He's saying that because he is faithful in my house, with him I speak Moses. And he I speak with Moses and he says I do it clearly. Clearly. Now isn't it nice when you ask someone a question and they say yes or no. Here's one of the biggest questions in my house. I hate asking this question. I'm sure it's not your house. What do you want for dinner? I don't know. Well, American? No. Chinese? No. Mexican? Eh, no. Greek? Romanian? Russian? Canadian? Where else we got? I don't know what I want. Okay. I'll go get some McDonald's. I don't want that. You said anything. Speak clearly. Well, you just bring something, and whatever it is, I'm not going to like it. Okay, just doing a fish sandwich. God spoke clearly to Moses. He said, you shall do this. You shall leave my people here. You shall take them here. You shall guide them here. You shall give them what I say. You will speak what I say. You will give them my law. You will make sure that they understand that everything that is coming to you has come from me because I have spoken to you clearly. And we see that these people, his family that were opposing him in this meeting, God is speaking to them. And he's saying, why are you opposing my chosen man? You should be supporting him. You should be helping him. But yet you are choosing one of them. Get struck down with leprosy for 30 days because God was not happy. He, he basically said, don't do this. Drops the mic and she has leprosy. Turns white. Moses goes on to lead his people. Now he had some helpers. And he had some other people that would lift his arms. He had some other people that would speak for him. But God chose him. Moses was a man with great integrity and tried faithfulness. In every part of his life, his faithfulness had been tried, and his faith in God had been tried, and he had been found to be faithful in all my house, so said God. This put the first of all the characteristics of Moses at the forefront. He was faithful. Church, before I go any further and speak about the expectation of a joyous birth. Are you faithful in your walk with Christ in everything that you do? Ask yourself that. I'm not asking you to stand up or raise your hand. You may not hear anything else in this sermon today, but I want you to ask your question, ask your mind this question. Am I faithful in everything that I do for the Lord? Because when you are, God will speak to you in such a way that you've never heard him before. And it says, with him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and with no riddles. Moses was therefore honored with a clear discovery of what was on God's mind. God's mind was in tune with Moses and Moses was in tune with God's mind. And more intimate communion with God 
had never been had before. This was a pinnacle that any other prophet whatsoever had ever had. Moses was in the presence of God Almighty because he had been found faithful. Church, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are faithful to God and you go to him, you will be in the presence of God Almighty. Jesus Christ will petition The Holy Spirit will speak when you stand in the glorious realm of the highest of high and the holiest of holies. What does this mean? The Bible describes Moses as one of the greatest prophets who had ever lived. Moses was born in a time that Israel was in great defeat. They're enslaved in Egypt and their growing population was getting to such abundance that the Egyptian king said, hey, they're going to get so many that they're going to be able to overpower us easily. We just need to go and kill all the firstborn. So Jochebed, Moses' wife, Moses' mother, says, no, not Moses. She does everything she can to save him, and it works. Do you think that when Jochebed was holding Moses for the first time, And he was wrapped in these swaddling clothes. And she looked down into Moses' eyes and Moses looked up into his mother's eyes. Do you think that she was looking at the greatest deliverer of their people that mankind would ever know? There was great expectation. She was willing to do whatever it took to save her child's life. Not because she knew that something was going to happen in the future, but because this was her child. This was a joy. This was something that she loved long before she ever birthed the child. She loved the child. Long before you were ever born, Jesus Christ loved you. He knitted you together by the womb. He knew your heart. He knew your soul. He knew your name because you were on his mind. And your your name was written in his heart. The expectation of a joy. And she was willing to do whatever it took. One could say a lot about his life and ministry. But I believe the greatest gift he passed on to all of us today was his devout belief and devotion to God. No matter the hardships or battles he had, Moses always kept God not only in his heart, but he kept him in his walk of life. He didn't just say it and speak it. He lived it out, and people saw it in his life. This expectation of joy as a child grew into something that a mother could be proud of. And we understand, as Isaiah 58, 11 says, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in the scorched places and make your bones strong, and you shall be strong, a water garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. We must understand that God loves us in such a way that as we continually strive to be closer to Him and our walk of faith is closer to Him, that He will satisfy us in every desire that we have, even in the driest of deserts, even in the harshest of places. Isaiah actually says, in the scorched places. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you felt that you were being scorched? Everywhere you turned, you were just being burned or fizzled out. And God says, no matter where you go, continually I will satisfy your desire and I will make your bones strong. From the morrow of the bone of the flesh to the morrow of the bones of the soul, God will satisfy you. Your desires will be in tune to him and his desires will be in tune with you. And no matter what you face in this world, the satisfaction will bring your desires in line with him and you will be content. How many of us in this room are content today? We're always looking for that little extra something. When we make sure that that little extra something is Christ, we know that that something will always be content with him. Moses, indeed, was a great expectation of his mother, Jochebed. But it was also a great expectation of a joyous birth. To God above. What about King David? In Acts chapter 13, 22, it says, When he had removed, he raised up David to their king, of whom he testified and said, 
I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. If you don't have it underlined, you, you should look at that. And underline it in your Bible. I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. I would at this time pick up my Bible and show to you where it's underlined in my Bible. But apparently someone in the first service decided they wanted the pastor's Bible. I'm sure they'll bring it back. <laughs> I pray they give it back. It's about wore out and falling apart. They probably realize it's not theirs when they open it up. But a man after God's own heart. Why is he after God's own heart? It goes on to say, he will do all my will. Are you a man, are you a woman, are you a child of God after God's own heart? Do you reach and strive to get a hold of God's heart that his will will be your will and his will will uh, encompass everything of your life and it will be shown to the world? By the way you talk, by the way you walk, by the way you act, by the way you eat, by the way you drink, by the way you dress. People will know you and the will of God in your life because they will say, here is a man, here is a woman after God's own heart. David was one of these people. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. Just like Moses, there was sin in David's life. But he still strived to be the man that God wanted him to be. Can you imagine that when his father Jesse saw him born, he said, well, here's my good and faithful son, David. He'll make a great shepherd. He'll do whatever he can to take care of my sheep. Do you think he ever once knew that he was going to be the greatest king and the greatest king ever that Israel will ever see? The greatest conqueror that Israel will ever see? The greatest person to ever lead the people of God into a place that God promised them for all? Do you ever think he saw that in his child's eyes? When he saw this joyous expectation of eight men, David being one of them, these sons, he also had two daughters, so ten in total. He looked at him and said, here is David, my son, the future king of Israel. That would have went great with all the other siblings. He just saw the joyous expectation of a birth of a son in his life. But just like any other mother and father should, he loved them before they ever knew them. David did have great accomplishments. David unified all of Israel. He conquered and made Jerusalem the capital of Israel. David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, solidifying it as the capital of Israel. Now, I want to pause here. I had a younger person come up to me and said, the Ark of the Covenant, he said, that's that thing in Raiders of the Lost Ark that they were trying and the ghost came out and killed everybody, right? I said, well, kind of, sort of. <laughs> I was just impressed that someone that young would know about Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> I said, well, it is an ark. And he said, so when we take the top off, it's going to kill everybody, right? I said, well, one, no. <laughs> and two, I don't think if you take it, the ghost is going to come out and kill everybody. I said, that's Hollywood. I said, but I am glad you recognize that it was the Ark of the Covenant. But he brought the Ark of the Covenant and he set it in the heart of Jerusalem, solidifying it as the capital of Israel. And the divinic line of David created a powerful dynasty that lasted for over 500 years. And the offspring would be blessed. And we see this in God's word where it says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever wouldn't it be something if God came to us and said I'm not only going to bless you now follow me on this I'm not only going to bless your spouse I hope you're listening I'm not only going to bless everything that y'all do hear this I'm going to bless your family wouldn't it be something if God said that in his word Church, he does. Brothers and sisters, you hear me. When you walk in line, whether it be your parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles, when you walk in line, step by step with God, God not only says he's going to bless you, but he says, I'll bless your children. He says, I'll bless your family. You mean to tell me that if I walk, with Christ in my life, not only are you going to bless me, you're going to bless my children. 
Where do I sign up? You gave your heart to Christ. You already did. Where are the blessings? Where's your faith? Where's your walk? Where's your devotion? Where's your prayer life? Where's the honoring of giving your time, your talents, and your tithe? God wants to bless you. Just as he did Moses. Just as he did King David. Were they perfect? No. But that will not stop them from blessing. I mean, what about David? As great as the king he was, he was still a liar. He was still a murderer. He still committed adultery. Not only in the presence of his men, but also in the presence of his God. He saw a woman he shouldn't have been looking at. Had relations with her when he knew he shouldn't have. With one of his mighty men, one of his great warriors, Uriah, his wife, while he was at battle and he should have been in battle with his army, he was standing on the top of a rooftop looking down on a woman he should not have been looking at and he should not have been desiring. He did things he should have not have done. And we couldn't get Uriah drunk enough to go and be with his wife so he could say it was his child. He took one of his best friends. A man who was willing to fight and die die for not only his king but his friend. And David sent him out to the front lines with orders of the rest of his mighty men. Put him in the front. And when he's way out in the front, y'all fall back so he can die. Not so much of an apple of a mama's eyes there. David was confronted. David was sorrowful and he repented. He didn't just go and ask that God would forgive him. He didn't do the new world act of forgiveness. God, I want forgiveness of this sin even though I'm going to do it tomorrow. God, I want forgiveness of this thought even though I'm going to think about it again in 10 minutes. Lord, I'm going to ask forgiveness of what I'm going to do today and tomorrow and next month and month after that and month after that because I'm just going to ask for forgiveness because in America and all around the world what we're seeing in the church today, people believe that they can ask for forgiveness so they forget they need repentance. Not only did David, the apple of a mother's eye, a father who was so in love with his son for seeing all that God would do with him, He asked for forgiveness, but he also asked for repentance. Meaning he turned his back to a sin and walked closer with Christ. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, is there anyone here today, you don't have to come confess with me. You don't have to stand up and confess to this church. But I am going to ask you, have you confessed your sins to God? If we confess, talking about us, God's people, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not only will he forgive us of our sins when we ask for it and we repent, but he will clean us to such a point that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when he does that, he will restore you just like he did David. Well, pastor, I just can't do it. I'm, I'm not worthy enough. I'm not good enough. I can't do what needs to be done. It's it's just, I've sinned so much. But God says, I'll restore you. There's too many people in this world wanting to wallow in their sin instead of bathe in the cleanliness and forgiveness of Christ. Because he has a use for us. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice this. We are his workmanship. God created you. He crafted you. He molded you. Some of us are taller than others. Some of us are wider than others. But God molded you and crafted you in such a way that he could use you in such a way that you could make a difference in all the world. And sometimes people would say, well, what does my difference make? Sometimes all the world is the people that you're around. Sometimes all the world is your family. 
that one friend who needs to see a godly person, and you're the only world that they see. He makes you in such a craftsman's and, and a workmanship. He says that I want to put you in use, created in Jesus Christ for good works. He has good works for each and every one of us. And he didn't come and say, listen, I've got good works for you until you turn 62. And when you turn 62 or 65, then I need you to stop working in the church and we'll let everybody else. I've done my time. Let somebody else do it. He didn't go to Moses because I don't see anywhere it says in Abraham. I don't see anywhere it says about Noah. I don't see anywhere where it says about Moses, Noah, all the people in the Old Testament or Peter and Paul or even Jesus when it said you get to a certain age and you can retire and not do anything for the glory of God. God. God said, you will work for me until I call you home. Do we not see that in Miss Georgia Fields? For those of you who don't know, Miss Georgia Fields passed earlier this morning. She is walking in glory right now. Me and her were good friends. She had no problem with telling me how much she loved me and setting me straight when I got out of line. I loved her for that. She did it with a kind heart. Do you realize she's walking in the streets of gold barefoot right now? If I know, which I think I do, Miss Georgia Fields, and I can't say Miss Fields or Miss Georgia, I just say Miss Georgia Fields, like I think I do, one, I know her husband was standing at the gate. Two, I know Jesus was standing at the gate and said, we've been waiting for you. I know she's probably already went to the Holy of Holies. She walked on that straight path, streets of gold. But I also know that she probably, because she talked about this, she has gotten her ankles and her knees up to her knees in those crystal blue seas and said, ooh, don't that feel good. And if you know Miss Georgia, she went to that tree of life and she wanted to see what fruit it was. And she's probably saying, I knew it was a peach all along. Let me ask you a question. Did you ever see anyone like Miss Georgia Fields? And I'm just using her as an example. There's many examples, good examples in this church that did not walk faithfully and do as Moses did, as Abraham did, and as King David did. To the moment God called her home, she faithfully worked for God. For many of y'all don't know, she was actually writing a book right now about the book of Revelation. She said, I don't know if I'm going to finish or not, but I'm going to keep trying. I'm praying I get a copy of it. The expectation of a birth. When this beautiful lady was born, the whole world may not know who she is. But her world around her, everybody knew of her. Everybody knew King David. They knew of his great accomplishments. They knew of his downfalls. They knew of his restorations. Everybody knew of Moses. They knew of his great accomplishments. They knew of his downfalls. They knew of his restoration. But when they were born, the confidence and the expectation of joy felt before the birth and during the birth was beyond measure. Not knowing what the future held, but God knew. What about John the Baptist? Luke chapter 1 verses 11 16 says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. This is when Zechariah was at the altar. And it says, Zechariah was troubled, and, with he, and when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second. Many of y'all would say, well, why was Zechariah fearful when he saw an angel? I mean, y'all would be fearful if you weren't in a house that you were greatly accustomed to, you knew. And let's say you open up the refrigerator door to get a glass of milk at 2 a.m. in the morning to go with the three cookies that you had just decided to eat. Don't judge me. And then you close that refrigerator and there's an angel standing out there. Hey, insert your name. Would you not be fearful? Would you not be scared? The first thing I'd have to do was clean a mess up. Let's not judge him for being fearful. But it says, but the angel said to him in verse number 13, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Isn't it something that when God's word speaks to you, 
and you know it's the voice, the voice of God, the fear is swept away. And the consciousness of the Holy Spirit that dwells within those that it abides comes to the forefront, and our ears are hearkened unto the word. For your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. Now they had been praying for a child. That she was long past an age of actually bearing a child. They were still praying, hoping, wishing. Can you imagine at this age when the Holy Spirit would come and say, hey, you're going to have a child. If that happened with me and Tanya right now, I'd be like, no. <laughs> we're not ready for that. <laughs> we're ready for the grandchildren, you know, bring them over two or three hours, put lots of sugar in them and send them home. I'm not ready to do the 24-7. I did my time. <laughs> but he comes to him and he says, the prayers have been answered. And your wife Elizabeth will bear your son and you shall call his name Jesus, 14, and you will have joy and gladness. Think about that. The baby, when it comes, will have joy and gladness in your life. How many of us need some joy and gladness? Do you realize that the minute that you birth the Holy Spirit in your life and you allow him to make that grand entrance and he encompasses not only your soul and your life that you will be full of joy and gladness and many will rejoice over his birth. A great multitude were happy. Not only that John was being born but they were happy for the birth of John and what it meant. For he will be great before the Lord. Now, this expectation of a joyous birth, knowing that John is coming, is already going to be great. The prayers are answered. But here the angel is telling him, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong, or strong drink. Now, that's going to be a sermon for next year. But notice that it goes on to say he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. But it says that he doesn't need to drink wine or strong drink. And then the Holy Spirit's going to be filled with him. We'll talk about that next year. But it says, even from the mother's room, and he will turn many of his children of Israel to the Lord their God. Filled with the Holy Spirit. How are they going to get? And it's God. He can do anything. But how is this triune God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, going to be able to fit in the womb of a woman that has a child in it and the Holy Spirit be in it as well? Folks, I'm 51 years old. I'm a big guy. The Holy Spirit has encompassed my life. And it's so encompassed my life that the Holy Spirit is overflowing like a water of life fountain. And when people get around any Christian, whether it be you or whether it be me, it's an overflowing fountain of life. And they can't help but feel the glorious touch of God when they get around you and they're going to try to put it in a child that's not even been born can you imagine the elation of Elizabeth not only is she holding a child and looking in his eyes when he's born but knowing before he is ever born that God has blessed him and that he will bring people back to their Lord and we are called to do the same each and every one of us has been called to bring God's people back to the Father, back to the Lord, because there's going to come a day where every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. And we are called just like John the Baptist, just like David, just like Moses, just like Zechariah, just like Elizabeth, to be light stands for Christ. You know, when we look in Psalms 51.8, it says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Folks, if you want to hear joy and gladness in your life, you're going to have to get rid of the sin in your life. But there will come a time when sin will not only break the body, but it will break the spirit that dwells within you because the Holy Spirit is not of yours. You're relying on your own. 
But there will come that time when God will come and he will heal that broken spiritual bone of yours and that broken spiritual bone that was full of the cancer of sin and evil in your life will rejoice and scream out that all the world will see it, that you have been filled, that you have been overwhelmed by the joy of Christ through the forgiveness of it. It won't help be able to reach out. Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together, was shaken. Just as your heart and your life will be shaken when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And there's many of us today that need to have a shaking up in our life. There's many of us today that need to have our homes shaken up. The Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit is wanting to do more, but yet we're not allowing it to come to the foundation and to the rooftop. We're asking God to give more, but yet we give less. We're not praying We're not doing everything that God, we're not reading His Word, we're not meditating on His Word, we're not being the givers as God had called us to give as far as our time, our talents, and our tithe. Let somebody else do it. I'm just here for the show. But God is very clear in here. It says, when they have prayed, it says, the Holy Spirit will come upon them just as it is you. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word God with boldness. And we are called to speak the word of God with boldness. Was Moses meek? Moses was considered the most meekest man of the world. Look in your Bibles and read it. The meekest man of the world, but yet he stood before a Pharaoh. The meekest man of the world, but yet he stood before Satan and evil himself and he boldly proclaimed everything God told him to, not because he was great, but because God was great. And because his faithfulness was in God, God used him just as he wants to use you. There's not a person hearing the sound of my voice today, whether you're watching it online, whether you're sitting still out in the parking lot, or you're in this room today, God made you for his use, for his son, that this world would be saved. That none would perish and all would have everlasting life. You were created in the workmanship of Christ. For Christ. Because Jesus Christ, Luke 1, verses 30 through 33 says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. The angel talking to Mary. For you have have found favor with God. How many of us right here would like to hear the word, You've been found favor with God. Wouldn't that be something? Favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now listen to this, verse number 32. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary, did you know You're going to be the mother of the Messiah, the King of kings, the Most High, the Lord of lords, the great Redeemer, the salvation for every soul. You will be this mother who has found favor with God. When you look into the eyes of your son Jesus, you look into the eyes of your Savior. Can you think of a better expectation of joy than that? To realize that every time you brush his hair back, every time you kiss his forehead, every time as a child he runs to you and he throws his arms around your neck and you pick him up off the ground, you're hugging the Savior of all mankind and he did it for one reason. She held him so you could be held by Christ alone. The expectation of a joyous birth. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 states that God loves us, but we also understand the prophecy of the birth of Jesus was foretold by many prophets over thousands of years. Before Gabriel, the angel of the Lord finally appeared to Mary and announced the immaculate conception of the birth of Jesus Christ. There are many verses in the Bible that we can quote. But the greatest and one of the greatest is when Jesus said, to reply to a question, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Church, I ask you, are you loving Christ with all your heart? Are you loving Christ with all your soul? Are you loving Christ with all your mind? 
This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. Love your neighbors as yourself. When you love Christ with all your heart, that means no matter what's going on in your life, you will love Him. When you love Him with all your soul because you feel the unction and the story of God and the Shekinah glory not only going around your soul, but going around your life, you'll be able to love Him with all your mind in anything that comes in the mouth, anything that comes through the eyes, anything that comes through the ears, anything that is taken or injected, you won't want any part of it because the mind, the body, and soul belong to Christ and you won't want anything that's pleasing to Him because Christ loves you. But for that to happen, you have to love Him with all your heart. You have to love Him with all your mind. And you have to love Him with all your soul. And when you've done this, you'll be able to love all your neighbors. The ones that speak good of you, and the ones that speak ill of you. The ones that want to break bread with you. And the ones that want to hit you with a bat over the head. The ones that dismiss you. And the ones that receive you. Have people done things to you in your life that hurt you? I'm sure there are. And the older you get, there'll be more and more people that hurt you and say things. Folks, I ain't trying to make light of it, but there's even people in this area that would look at me and say, look at him. He's short. He's ugly. He's fat. And he yells out sermons. Okay. True. <laughs> but don't forget I love Jesus. And that's the only reason I'm up here. What reason are you here for God? I know mine. Let us pray, Father. As we come right now, near this time of invitation, I pray for someone here today that needs to have a prayer, prayed over them that they would come to me. Pastor Jeremy's here. But they would allow one of us to pray over them. Maybe they just want to come to an altar. It's just wood and carpet and paint and stain. There's nothing special about it, but the one that's waiting for them to meet them. Maybe there's someone here today, a husband or a wife, that's willing to grab the hand and say, hey, for the first time in a long time, let's go pray for our family. Let's go pray for our children and our grandchildren. Let's pray for a business. Let's pray for this country. Let's pray for our marriage. Father, whatever you're calling, I pray they will obey that calling. Maybe today is the day when someone accepts you as the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that they would accept your son. They would ask for forgiveness. They would repent. And they would walk towards you. Maybe it's the first time that's ever in their mind that they would want to be a part of the ministry of this church and join Barnwell First Baptist. Lord, if it be your will, they join and be a part of this church family. Let them come. But I ask, Lord, that thy will be done. For in Christ's name, I pray. Amen. If you would, please stand during this time of... We hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Please be sure to like and follow us on Facebook at FBC Barnwell for important updates. To give online, please visit our website at www.fbcbarnwell.org. Tithes and offerings are also accepted in the church office located at 161 Allen Street or via the Postal Service by mailing your donation to the address on the screen. Remember this week to keep putting God first in all that you do.